and gentlemen, well ba welcome back to the Sustainable Web3 Singapore 2023 conference sponsored by Huawei Cloud. Now we look at Western Australia and Southeast Asia. We are privileged to have Dr. Andrei Gwilsowski, lecturer, University of Western Australia, who will moderate the panel on sustainable decentralized Web3 infrastructure. 女士们、先生们，欢迎大家回到由华为云主办的2023年可持续Web3大会。茶歇之后，我们来看看西澳和东南亚的机遇。我们很荣幸地邀请到来自西澳大学的讲师Dr. Andres Guizdowski来主持接下来的圆桌讨论。这个圆桌是关于可持续的去中心化Web3基础设施。Dr. Andres panelists are Dario Dangba. Senior Advisor, Green Square DC. Daniel Keynes, Head of Risk, Block Square. And Walt Kusen, Founder and CEO of Green Square DC. We are very excited to have Dario Dumba, Green Square DC Gaoji顾问. Daniel Keynes, Block Square Fengxian Zhuguan. Walt Kusen, Green Square DC Chuangshiren Jian CEO. Welcome, everyone. There's probably more people who will be watching us uh, online on video than uh, the, the modest audience, but a very committed audience that we have here. Uh, I see there's a lot of us uh, here still uh, glued to our mobile phones. I'm not going to ask you to switch them off, but could you imagine if you could leave? Or I give you a choice uh, just to make it more engaging. You've heard about power outages. You've heard about outages uh, in the internet where banks go down, where you cannot get your money. You've heard about perhaps Optus in Australia where 10 million people didn't have access to the internet. In some cases, in life-threatening situations. Now, I give you a choice. Uh, we're sitting in a nice, comfortable uh, air conditioning room. Would you prefer to spend a day without air conditioning or a day without the internet? So. Who is, who is for the day without air conditioning? One person. A day without the internet. All right, two or three people, good detox. Now, but this, uh, just besides an anecdote, this, uh, the, the fact that we may potentially lose access to internet is not just our convenience of checking the news or maybe being on social media. It has serious implications for national security, uh, for life-threatening situations, and mainly for economy as we're moving into decentralized and more powerful uh, options or upgraded options as we would like to think in Web3, where our money is actually in data centers. So no more physical cash if you are interested in uh, central bank digital currencies or any other options, but our money actually being data cent in data centers. To what extent is this, inf in this, this infrastructure decentralized and sustainable so that it can support us and feed the new uh, growing economy? And we're just at the, at the beginning, at the cusp of, of this uh, new economy. Um, there is no more time actually for academic discussions here. We always, I'm, I'm, as an academic, I probably should be the last person saying that. We all welcome research, but uh, at this stage, uh, we know that we need a much more powerful data centers and digital infrastructure as we're going into AI and fully digital economy, much more immersive. Now, our current infrastructure can potentially choke on the centralized um, data uh, failure, points of failure and we don't have a proper, proper diversification. So at this stage, we, we don't have much, much more time for, for kind of academic discussions, and that's why I'm so excited to bring to the panel practitioners, people who devoted their lives and careers to working in that space. Uh, Walton, the CEO of uh, Green Square DC, uh, Daryl, who is uh, doing the international operations and uh, has incredible wealth of experience starting at NASA about 30 years ago, uh, well versed in, in uh, digital economy and uh, data centers and um, Daniel, who will be talking about decentralized uh, real estate, how to actually put real estate and uh, assets on the, uh, on the blockchain to make the economy much more inclusive. But as a, as a kind of starting point, I want to show you some, uh, some numbers so that there is no doubt. These are the numbers. The estimates of the digital growing economy that will be powered by blockchain and AI is about $35 trillion by 2030. So that's much more than the GDP of United States, Singapore, and Australia put together. So we know that the economy is going to grow massively. But we don't have enough uh, and, and powerful data centers to uh, support it in that, this, this, uh, the diversify and secure way. Now, 
that's, that's a problem here, because on the one hand, we have a potential growth, huge growth, but we know that these data center, the conventional traditional data centers are consuming a lot of power, fossil fuel power. And we know also from a recent research uh, that this will uh, cause the increase of global warming by two, close to two Celsius degrees, which is deadly to humans. So if you feel hot outside of the, of the cool uh, room today, that's gonna be much more deadlier tomorrow. So how do we solve that problem of growing economy, but also being uh, economy, uh, uh, ec ecologically sustainable? And the third problem is those technologies, especially AI, will take your jobs. And that's not a joke, that's not a, uh, a conspiracy theory. This data comes from the World Economic Forum. About 40% of jobs will be gone by 2030. 40%, all jobs. So how do we address those uh, burning issues? And uh, that would be perhaps the context for my first question to our panelists. How does big global, global trends affect uh, business from your point of view? And um, you know, uh, how do you deal with these kind of questions on the local business level? Any of you, welcome. Well, I think it's, it's very clear that um, we're facing a, uh, uh, an energy crisis. If we're talking about this kind of consumption and data centers, it's um, it's been pretty been pretty quiet about it until recently, and I think people are starting to wake up and realize how much power data centers actually consume, and how much heat they reject into um, into the to the atmosphere, and something has fundamentally got to change. Uh, I mean, we're we're hitting the intersection of we're just now into now beginning to electrify everything. Electric cars are going everywhere. We're we're trying to decarbonize and move away from fossil fuels and shut down um, power plants, coal and, and gas-fired power plants, and move to variable renewable energy. And it's not, it's not happening fast enough. And I think we're at the forefront uh, of being at risk of being called um, power hogs or part of the problem as, a part, as, as opposed to being part of the solution. And I think where we, we come in is to try to be part of the solution. How do we do this? Um, how do we distribute the, the data center compute assets? How do we cool them, power them more efficiently? How do we produce more power than we actually consume so that we're good citizens of the planet? Um, how do we um, make sure that we can put them in geographies where perhaps there's free cooling to be had or it's easier to cool? You'll, you'll, you will have seen a lot of data centers going into the Nordics, for example, um, over the last few years because they can use uh, free energy to cool it. So I think, if anything, um, this is, it, it, it's at the point of a crisis, but it's also at the point of enabling. Uh, so when you think that 40% of all work is going to go away, that may not necessarily be a bad thing, uh, because there, there's a lot of people who theorize that if you free up humans from um, the mundane tasks that they're doing, they move on and do much more interesting things. And perhaps there's more intellectual capital and intellectual work that will be done as some of these roles are, are taken over. So while I think there's risk um, and there is an impending crisis, I also think there's opportunity. Well, Walt, what do you think, uh, do you see that, uh, the, because you, you talk a lot with your customers, with stakeholders, are these issues important to them? If I'm being deadly serious, sustainability as a thing in our industry that I can, we can definitely speak to is still a really, really, really nice to have. It's still not a must-have, and but again, the, you know, we're in a, you know, w w if we went back only a few years, then it wasn't even a really nice-to-have, right? And and I can tell you one thing about the data center industry: a, it's an industry that's um, almost allergic to change. And the reason why it's allergic to change, why I say say that, is that the most fundamental tenet of any data center has always been resiliency, keeping that keeping that light up i.e. not letting them go down that we've seen a few times recently. Fundamentally, the best way to keep the light on is to not change anything. So if you look back, if you are looking back from this point in time back in history, the risk with data centers was change. The interesting thing, though, is moving forward, the risk is actually going to be not changing because there's a lot of stuff that's now going to happen because of this decarbonisation and especially because of these changes that's happening in the, in the white space. These chipsets are getting hotter and hotter. GPU and generative AI, AI-enabled servers are a 10x increase in power, there, therefore heat. 
So th the whole cooling environment, the whole the whole architecture, design architecture of a data center has to fundamentally change. And that's a real challenge for the sector and that, if I'm being honest, the reason why we chose this time to come uh, and, and, and pursue this is because we know that it's an industry that struggles with change for a very real reason. I'm not being, I'm not being mean to the industry in saying that. Everyone in the industry agrees. And so it, it, I agree I, I agree with Dale. It is absolutely, it must change. I see it, there's opportunity as well. Some of these increases, you know, that's happening um, with generative AI, generative AI and large language models, the increase in density, that can actually lead to greater sustainability because your data halls get vastly smaller, which means your data centers can get much smaller, which means from embodied carbon perspective, like we've, we're going to be pulling out in our data center in Perth over a million tons of embodied carbon. Um, with liquid cooling that you virtually have to do to cool these GPU-based servers, they are, they're also 20 to 30% more energy efficient, therefore they use 20 to 30% less power um, and, and lower, lower PUE um, than traditional data centers. So there is great opportunity out there, but it's now is the time for enablers to come and, uh, and play that important role, and that's what we're looking to do. Thanks for that. We'll, uh, I'll probably uh, uh, drill a bit more on those technical questions, how you do it, but I would also like to uh, give an opportunity to talk uh, to, to Daniel, who uh, I would like to know from you, how do you deal with these kind of issues um, to make the economy more sustainable from the social uh, point of view? You know, Daryl mentioned that it's going to be good. Some people will be laid off. They have more time for doing intellectual work. Maybe in the transition period, they will be economically struggle. So is there any uh, solutions that we can, um, that, that we, you know, the blockchain Web3 technologies could uh, provide to those questions? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I think from a tokenization perspective, um, I think we really have the ability here to democratize the real estate asset class. I think it's historically uh, acted as a way to preserve wealth, uh, and, and also sort of foster economic inequality where barriers to entry were incredibly high. But through the use of tokenization, we can, we can lower those barriers. We can allow people from vastly different economic backgrounds to now participate in this industry. And that participation can, can take place in a whole number of ways, from uh, access and participation in co-living to being able to invest in real estate at a level that meets your personal financial circumstance. So the challenges that, that, that you've highlighted there are really core to the challenges that we're trying to solve. Yeah. Uh, just to be frank, I see a lot of young people, and many of my students are probably uh, your age, and they struggle with one question. I don't have the same opportunities as my parents. To buy an apartment in Australia, Western Australia, you, a modest apartment, what would be the price? Two bedroom, half a million? Uh, easy, yeah? 650. What about Singapore? How much would you pay? Two bedroom apartment. Could you afford it as a graduate? Over two million. Yes, over two million. So these are real problems that tokenization could solve, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it would allow you to not only invest in real estate at a level that meets your personal circumstance, but also to build up a diversified portfolio of real estate, geographically, based on niche type, um, and that way there's really a greater level of managing the risk associated with, with investing in an ass asset class, rather than owning a block of apartments where your concentration risk is incredibly high, you can now diversify out in, in many different ways. And, and that's a good point of diversification. So I would like to bring us more to the uh, very special relationship Singapore has with Australia, and especially Western Australia. And if we can explore some of the opportunities uh, from a geopolitical point of view, economic and, and um, you know, ecological point of view, uh, how do you address some of those uh, opportunities and what kind of solutions do you provide? Yep, um, any aspect? Uh, Walt, yeah. yeah. I guess in the digital age, it probably starts with connectivity. If you don't have connectivity, you probably don't have that much to worry about. Um, uh, certainly the West Australian coast, and, and also so does <coughs> the rest of Australia, is very well connected. Uh, Perth, as an example, 
is, uh, has five subsea cables, um, of which I think three or four go directly to Singapore. From a latency perspective, it, um, you know, it's got half the latency than, than the East Coast, than <coughs> Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane into, into Singapore. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a really important one. I think a, a lesser known feature, I think some people know that, but a lesser known one is um, uh, Australia and Singapore share a somewhat unique digital free trade agreement that is an agreement that's, that's only been in place for a few years. My understanding is Singapore only has similar agreements with, I believe, the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Korea. So I think there's there's only those those countries that have that that enables in this world of increasing cybersecurity and and data sovereignty. That's uh, maybe we can pause here. I, I'm not yeah. sure whether uh, whether we are aware. That's a very important uh, question. We're talking about diversifying and decentralizing physical infrastructure. Yeah. But on the one hand, uh, that's a, something that is very much desired. On the other hand, there is regulations that may restrict banks, for example for moving the data overseas. Yeah. But having that agreement, for example, could change the game. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, it, and it is something that, that is quite unique, and it's something that um, I think it will become more and more powerful. I think we probably all agree, and certainly in the data center industry, the, the um, you know, the, um, very much the, th the, the thought is that cyber, you know, um, data sovereignty is gonna be get more and more important, more powerful, more countries again to enact and with less trust, which is not a great thing. It's not a great out outcome, but it's, it's the way we're all heading, unfortunately. Um, and so, the, yeah, so, so that document uh, and that enablement of data to move freely between, um, say, Singapore and Australia is, is, is really key. And just another thing as well, economics at the end of the day always drives outcomes, um, you know, and, um, and from a... You know, Singapore is is well regarded as being the most constrained data center market in the world, and also the most expensive data center market in the world. So, if you have your data sitting in, in a data center here, and obviously there's a very real reason why, there's a very real reason why Singapore became the second largest data center market in the world as well. Um, rest assured, you're paying more than everywhere else in the world. And let's say down, we're building out 96 megawatts down in Perth at our WAI1 data center. We would be in round figures around half the rate. The the you so know you mean half the cost of, of yep data center current half here. the cost to 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 as compared to Singapore, and the power is less than half. Wait a second. How do you cost. do it? What's that? Could you explain that to from a kind of technical point of view? How do you uh, do that? It's half cost. That's a big a claim. A lot of it is supply and demand. So because there's very high like supply and demand is sets pricing. And very little else really matters. So in Singapore, very, very high demand, very low supply. It's the reason why, go oh. figure, the rate is so high. It's the highest data center, you know, it's, it's the most expensive data center market in the world. So, it, it, and, it, and to be honest, in this point, it's not, ju it's not just us in Perth that can, be, that can be substantially cheaper. Lots of markets can, because again, supply is supply and demand. So, and, and but, but what other markets can't match West Australia in is that, is that power pricing. So Western Australia has some of the cheapest power on earth, which is so very, what which is very what sources of power are we talking about? Uh, green power. We are doing our own green power. So we've got our own 300 megawatt wind and solar farm out at a place called East Hyden that's, that's in planning. Um, Western Australia has, if through, a, through a domestic, uh, a domestic, um, um, uh, gas reservation policy, so it reserves a lot of its gas, so it, it's, it doesn't compete on global markets for um, for its for its gas supply into its grid. So it's uh, it's 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 very unique in that re in that regard. So so your biggest your biggest monthly and annual fixed cost in any data center is power. So we can provide power that is significantly che significantly cheaper than Singapore and sig significantly cheaper than almost any market in the world. And it's green. And yes. it's green. Well, it's a transition today, so we have to realize that, that realistically today, um, Australia has, has deployed approximately zero kilowatts of renewable power, and it is in the um, transition <coughs> fuel of natural gas and the natural gas reserves because Western Australia is a net exporter of, of natural gas, but that will change. 
Um, and as Walt said, we, uh, we have a 300 megawatt developable site for, um, for wind and solar. But it's, it's not just the, the cheaper power, it's also doing it more efficiently. Yeah. So being able to cool the data center more efficiently, um, being able to reject the heat, uh, the technical terms of how we, how we do that more efficiently, overall costs less to provide that service. And, and, and I think it's important, while well, I'm on the technical thing, it's important to think about these GPUs. So what, what powers AI, right? It's actually GPUs. It's from people like NVIDIA and, and, and others are developing them. Now, if you haven't seen one, a GPU is about the size of your iPhone um, or your Samsung Galaxy or whatever, a little bit thicker, the actual chip itself. However, what sits on top of it is a chunk of steel that weighs five times what the chip does. And that's just to reject the heat off that chip. It's just air cooling. Now, if you can get, and there'll be transitions that'll get us there. So we'll see uh, what we call rear door heat exchangers, which is effectively a big radiator with cold water flowing through it off the back where the hot water, uh, hot air, sorry, comes out from the, um, from the chips. And then we'll see direct to chip and we'll eventually see immersion. And as you start to be able to do that, you can remove this excess weight, you can remove um, this unnecessary um, uh, material and the very inefficient heat exchange of air because basic physics, water exchanges heat five times faster than air does. So you can imagine if it's five times more efficient at pulling heat out, then it will take five times less the energy to get that heat off of those chips. Uh, could you, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of aware that many uh, people in the audience hear this number is X megawatts. Could you exemplify visually what that really means? Mm. Like, for example, um, the power consumption, or, or you know, uh, yes, example. So that we can visual see. It. So in in Perth, we're developing out, and it'll in stages. We'll, we'll get to about a hundred megawatts. We're getting to ninety six megawatts. Let's call it, and that is enough to power around 150,000 houses. Oh, okay. So j just to put it in some level of perspective, and 150,000 houses is a, is a lot of houses, right? So it's, uh, that, that hopefully gives some, some perspective. And in terms of the, uh, the GPU and the, the data, uh, how much of the market could you potentially cover? For example, if you were addressing the Singaporean market? Well, I think it, 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 it's a really interesting question about the, the Singaporean market because it has some artificial market dynamics. And, you know, as Walt said, uh, supply and demand determines prices. But when you put externalities in, for example, you have a conflict between um, a, a statement that's widely believed that uh, we call it data sovereignty. That means that any sort of private information, your banking details, personally identifiable information, has to remain within the boundaries of the, the city state. Um, that is probably not true, but as, and, and I live in Singapore, so uh, Singaporeans like to double confirm. So what we need is, is MAS to actually come out and say, yes, you're allowed to host uh, this information, say, in Perth. But the, the conflict is between saying you have to keep things resident, and by the way, you can't build any more data centers. Uh, I, I don't think it's, it's probably not widely known in the, in the room, it may be, that about three years ago, um, Singapore put a moratorium on the building of any new data centers and they just said stop and they stopped for three years. They've now released a small amount, we consider it small, it's 80 megawatts to, to four different providers. Um, that's only 20 megawatts per, per provider. We're saying that's about a um, thousand, two thousand square meter building. It would be a, t a 10 or 20 megawatt uh, facility. So they're not very, very big. Um, and that has forced an, an unnatural dynamic in the market. Yeah. So if you're allowed, if you can get past the, the privacy and the security of that data, then um, basically the all of the Singapore market would be uh, addressable in a place like Perth or, or perhaps even Johor Bahru. Um, since we are in the Web3 context here um, and, and the questions in the previous panel were uh, all about um, decentralized ownership and tokenization, um, how about blockchain tokenization could address some of these questions that uh, all of us have a little bit of a share in uh, some of the uh, infrastructure. It's not only decentralized physically, but also in terms of governance and ownership. Are there any solutions in 
in blockchain and Instagram tokenize. Sure, yeah. Well, I think firstly, I just want to speak about the, the, the partnerships that, that, that you've mentioned that are happening within the region. Um, you know, I think these are great and they can probably be surmised is that all ships rise with the tide, mm. right? Um, I think it's only going to foster regulatory and legislative synergy within the region. Uh, and this is going to help, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the points that were just mentioned a moment ago in terms of uh, cross-border trade. Um, I think it's also going to help foster the sharing of human resource. Um, and more importantly, that human resources and, uh, and the talent pool remain within the region, particularly in Web3, where there are other regions around the world that are also doing a lot to, to, to grow their, their respective industries. Uh, and it can ensure that those talent pools remain within the region and they don't, they don't go for greener pastures and the Americas or, or Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, I think these partnerships can only, can only foster good results. Um, so we just... Yeah, no, I was point? kind of coming back to the question of tokenization. Uh, sure. Can we participate in, uh, I'm not sure that what you, your company would allow that, but uh, probably not. I think it would be challenging. you on the spot, we didn't discuss it. Yeah, no, exactly. I think it would be really challenging. I, I love the notion of it. I think the notion of it is, is really interesting and, and, and even somewhat compelling. I think where it could fall down and not pub, uh, pass the, the pub test, as we call it in Australia, is um, uh, from a, a government regulation. When, when FERB, so to have any foreign investment in a data centre in Australia, it has to be approved by, by FERB, the Foreign Investment Review Board. And I think that they, one of their big, 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 um, the onus of, 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 their, of their investigation is always who exactly are these investors? And we want to know everything exactly. about them. So regulation. Again, it would be great if we didn't have to live in a world like that, but again, here we yes, are. Sure. I, I, think think I think in that regard, it might, it might be a challenge. It's going to come down to ownership and, and governance. And, and responsibility. And, and who is responsible. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, we, we were talking earlier about outages. There's been outages in Australia. There, there was an outage a few weeks ago here in Singapore with a couple of the banks going down. And ultimately, who can MAS, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, look at and you know, where's the one throat for them to choke when, when they say you're not allowed to have your bank down for this, this period of time? And it happens to be uh, one of the data center providers that I won't name, but who, who appears to be the one on the hook. But the banks ultimately, MIS can't reach through to the data center, but they can to the bank. And then Sorry. thereby the bank can then go. And, and so as we, I, I, th I think it's the future, but as we, as we do this, digitalization and, and distribution. I, mean, I, I was on the internet back in the US when it was still called DARPANET. You know, it was a research project. Um, th that's how old I am. And um, it, it has grown and we've seen it and it was always designed to be highly distributed Correct. and yeah. without a single authority. But we actually see all the internet services providers trying to run their networks as a single command and control authority, which is why Optus went down two weeks ago <laughs> in Australia. Yeah, I think um, I'd just like to slightly counter, counter your point because I think it's really important. Uh, you're going to need to provide a clear line of sight to the investors that are holding uh, equity of some sort yeah. in your organization or your building or whatever, whatever the, uh, the asset is that you're tokenizing. And I think BlockSquare, as, a, as an infrastructure provider of technology, saw this from the outset. So the technology that we provide in terms of allowing people to operate their m tokenization marketplace yeah. um, has the security or securitization features embedded in it. So that's KYC, that's AML, that's yeah. ensuring that everybody that participates in your marketplace is registered, is known. Um, of course, then what we do is facilitate bridges inward to uh, more of the um, decentralized world. But in, ter in terms of allowing that, that, that that's a technology yeah. feature that we, we do have. I think it might have just been, and, and I agree, and I, I appreciate that, that, um, that feedback. I think it, it might just be the volume, you know, like mm -hmm. FERB might be just used to looking at one or two investors. Again, I, and it could be right, it's very unproven, right? It's just all theoretic at this stage. But if there's like, oh, we've got, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 investors, that, that might, might make them go, ooh. Ooh, no. Sure. No, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of question marks in gray area there, but uh, you know, the, in, in terms of exploring ways to finance new, uh, new solar farms, for example, how you would go about that, yeah. um, you know, tokenization is definitely an avenue to, to at least yeah. explore. Mm -hmm.
So we still have uh, regulatory challenges, but the technology is already there. As I say, the, the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed. Um, so from the uh, challenges that we kind of encounter, do you see any challenges and issues in, the, uh, in your market in, uh, that can stop uh, your business from uh, getting where you want to get? Um, any obstacles, any issues and challenges? Power. Power. You mean I like that, uh, I who control it, uh, yeah. uh, human power? And I think that's <laughs> industry-wide. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's, not, that's not a question, I think, that, that you know, should be put just to, to one uh, data center provider. This is, we're competing for this power, right? This power that's being brought online, whether it be renewable or not, um, is, is gonna, it's gonna charge your Tesla. It's, it's going to increasingly be needed for other things, and we're competing for that. And um, if you wanna think about the internet and the data center industry as being arcane and slow to move, just go talk to a utility, for Christ's sake. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, Daniel, would you like to add anything? Like, what would be the challenges for you for tokenization of? Sure. Yeah. The last so, well, I think there's the there's the umbrella uh, answer that's given for the whole industry in terms of Web3, which is regulation, regulatory uh, uncertainty, and obtaining that clarity. Um, but I think when we're dealing with real estate tokenization, there are also some more specific challenges around regulation and legislation which we face. One of the largest is. Um, synergizing and, and, and connecting with the land registry of a, of, a, of a country and ensuring that we can provide tokenized real estate uh, which is reflected on the title of a property with the land registry. Um, and I'm proud to sit up here today and tell you that uh, we're the first organization in the world to have a tokenized real estate property notarized and added to the land registry of a country um, and within the EU no, nonetheless. Um, so, so this is definitely a, a challenge that we're facing, but also a, a challenge that we think we found a solution for. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? I usually uh, finish with questions from the audience. And uh, those who are watching us on, uh, I don't know whether it's going to be a YouTube or some kind of internal channel, uh, if you would like to reach out to our panelists, uh, that's Green Square DC. Um, with the CEO uh, Walt and uh, Daryl, responsible for international relationships, and Block Square. There's, there's a lot of squares. It's not. It's a kind of <laughs> Web3 coincidence. And uh, Daniel from uh, 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 Block Square. My apologies. So we're almost out of time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, uh, our distinguished panelists, for for being here. And Thanks, Andre. Uh, yeah. We're looking Thanks forward Andre. to the drinks. Thank you very much. Yay. Networking. Thank you. Yay.